what to do if you think you've committed the unpardonable sin. First, what I'd want to say is that you probably haven't. Um, and if you've watched the past several videos I've done on this topic, um, what I'm trying to convey is that I think the vast majority of time, probably 99.9% .9 of the time when people think they've committed the unpardonable sin, they have not. And I think mostly it comes from people not accurately understanding the scriptures that they are thinking of that are causing them to um, have so much fear. But what if you still feel stuck in that? What if you still feel convinced that for you, in your situation, you, you have committed the unpardonable, the unforgivable sin. Maybe you're convinced that you're in a Hebrew six category. It's impossible for you to be renewed again to repentance. You're an Esau, Hebrews 12, who though he diligently sought uh, with tears, he found no place for repentance. So maybe you're just still wrapped up in that sort of uh, mentality. What do you do? What do you do if you are convinced that you have committed the unpardonable sin and that your situation is impossible. You're locked in to this fate of hell. This, this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, and I'm finding more and more as I'm doing this video, hearing from people and, and even just as I've been kind of studying, listening to other, uh, teachers talk about this concept and I'm looking in the, the YouTube comments and I'm seeing so many people that are just really, really wrapped up in, bondage to fear of this, uh, this concept. So here's what I, I'm going to, what I want to do is I want to, in this video, just give you some encouragement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share some scriptures and give some thoughts on them. And these things that I'm going to share are things that I personally had to learn for myself when um, I, I had a season of life um, about 10 years ago or so where I was really wrapped up, really uh, in bondage to fear of, of this whole concept. I, and it, it, to summarize it, I was convinced that God had basically kind of locked me out of salvation due to my sin. And, and I was in that unreconcilable uh condition, you know, that I thought Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 12 were talking about. I thought it was impossible for me to be renewed to repentance. And so I had to fight for faith in that time. Um, and I had to, I think God had to, to teach me a lot, a lot of things. Um, he, I, I found a lot of comfort in a lot of different scriptures in that time, um, that, that in the midst of the terror and the torment of what it what it was to be in the middle of that that fear and that that's something that I think a lot of people don't really grasp just how intense it, it, this can be for some people and, and probably some people who who are just built with a certain emotional uh, bent toward toward deeper thinking uh, just different personality types are probably more prone to struggle with this fear uh, like I was. Uh, I think probably, again, there's, there's certain personality types that are more prone to deal with this. And then others, um, even if they backslide and sin, it, it just doesn't really affect them. So I don't, I don't know why that is, but, but I know that, that there are people who deal with, uh, real terror and torment. And so that, those are the ones that I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping to help in, in these videos and this video in, in particular. So first I want to encourage you to remember and believe that nothing is impossible with God. What gets people wrapped up in this, this situation where they feel so condemned, so hopeless is it's this idea that for them, their situation is impossible, that they, they feel like they've locked themselves in into this certain condition, whether it's a hardness of heart that can't repent or, or this unforgivable sin that, that there's no forgiveness for, um, they feel like it's impossible. Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, O Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth. 
by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you or nothing is impossible for you. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Luke 1, 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. So take truth like this and push it right back against those feelings of despair and hopelessness and condemnation that are telling you your situation is impossible. If you look in the Bible, what God looks for in people, what he waits for, what he, um, I think, even allows us to go through situations and circumstances like this um, is so that we would learn to believe, so that we would learn to trust him, even when everything seems uh, to be telling us that we shouldn't, even when everything seems to be telling us that we should just give up, that we should abandon faith, that it's not worth it, that God's not even listening. He doesn't even care. Um, it, it, story after story in the Bible, saint after saint in the Bible experiences situations like that where their outward circumstances tell them this is a hopeless and impossible situation. And what God looks for, what God wants to produce in people is a faith that rises up above that, that presses through that. When there's things telling you this is impossible, what I think God would want, what he wants to work in you is a faith that says, no, nothing, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing means nothing. God is bigger. He's bigger than your condemnation. He's bigger than your, your sin. He's bigger than your failure. Um, <clears throat> when the people were at the Red Sea, when Israel was at the Red Sea, they had the sea in front of them, the army behind them. Um, I think that can kind of relate to, to certain situations we might find ourselves in where it feels like we've got condemnation and sin in front of us and behind us, and there's no way out. But God is the God who, when we believe and look to him, he, he, he makes a way. God makes a way, he, and he wants to make a way for your situation. Uh, nothing is impossible with God. So combat your fears and condemnation and your hopelessness with truth. Two, another thing I want to encourage you guys with, if you are in this struggle of fearing the unpardonable sin, worried that you've committed it, um, be like the Canaanite woman. Um, so I'm going to read this story from Matthew, uh, just this quick little story from Matthew 15, 21 through 20. I think there's some really helpful, encouraging principles in this um, that, that can give you some direction. And Jesus went away from there. And withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. Jesus was in that situation, silent to her, her pleas, to her asking for help. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. So, so now you have seemingly this woman who's just coming to Jesus in this desperate situation, uh, asking for help. And you have now both Jesus and the disciples. The evidence to her, what she's seeing from Jesus' lack of response, and what she's then seeing confirmed by the disciples' words, saying, Look, just like send her away. Uh, make her go away. And she's hearing this stuff. I'm sure she's hearing this. She's both seeing Jesus ignoring her and she's seeing the disciples saying, you know, she's not worth our time, basically, and send her away. And so then Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now, now we have Jesus not only being silent to her, but now he's communicating something to her, seemingly confirming that, yeah, he he wants nothing to do with her. He's not going to help her. He's not interested in her situation. He's not interested in helping her out. And don't we, I think, find ourselves in situations like that sometimes where we are coming to God. We're trying to come to him, maybe even after moments of failure and sin. And what we experience from Jesus, what we 
what we feel that we experience is that he is ignoring us. He's silent. He's not listening. He's not responding, kind of like this situation with this woman. And then not only that, but then all these thoughts and ideas, kind of like the voices of the disciples saying, just send her away. Like whether that comes from our own conscience or whether that's coming from our own thoughts about, you know, well, what this person, we can kind of can even subconsciously, you know, maybe insert different sermons we've heard in the past and all these, these voices of condemnation that I think um, start to communicate and confirm with each other that, yes, I am condemned. My situation is hopeless. And so when we come to God, we're trying to come to him in faith, we get this pushback. And, and then not only that, but now we have Jesus saying to this woman, listen to what he says. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, but the, it says, but she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So, okay, so now you have Jesus ignoring her. You have the words of the disciples. And now you have Jesus just plainly, seemingly again saying, I, I am not interested in helping you in your situation. This, I think, is all that Jesus knew, I think, knew that this woman had faith. And I think he he wasn't trying to be cruel. I think there's a lot in this story that, that if you just read it in a quick way, it could be come across in a really wrong way. I don't think Jesus was trying to be mean. I don't think he was trying to confirm to people. Um, you know, this was the common uh, custom of, of how you would refer to the Canaanites. You know, you, the, the, you'd refer to them as dogs. And I don't think Jesus was confirming that saying, yes, this is the correct way to treat these people. I think he was testing this woman. I think he knew what was in her and he was um, allowing this situation to happen, to bring something out of her that he, he, he perceived was in her. And I think you see that is clear when you see what happens next. But I think, again, I think we, <clears throat> we can find ourselves in these sort of situations, whether it's dealing with the unpardonable, unforgivable sin or something else where we're coming to God, we're coming to Jesus, we're seeking him. And it seems like he's silent, he's absent, he's not caring. And then we have these other voices in our heads saying, you know, we need to just go away. We're not worth Jesus's time because, you know, just condemnation and things like that. But then again, you might even have Jesus's words. How I think this applies to the situation of the unpardonable sin is that here you have seemingly Jesus confirming this woman's hopeless situation. It seems like he's saying something to this woman to confirm that, yeah, you're not worth my time is what it seems like Jesus is saying to her. And I think that applies to so many people who take these scriptures. They'll look at the unpardonable sin passage or the Hebrew six passage. And they'll say, this is Jesus. This, this to me is, is as if Jesus is saying this to me, Jesus is telling me, you know, it's not just my thoughts. It's not just my own, you know, uh, mind making up this condemnation. And people think now I have it confirmed. It's as if God through his, his own words is confirming to me that I am condemned. I'm a lost cause. And so I think in the same way people come across these unforgivable sin passages and feel that God is, God is the one condemning them. I think that applies and, and you kind of get a picture of that in the story where Jesus was seemingly confirming with his words that this woman's case was hopeless, but yet it wasn't. It, it wasn't. This was, again, I think a test of faith. And so let's look at what happens here. So um, she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So all the evidence, all the evidence initially in the story indicated or outright proved seemingly that this woman's case was hopeless. That was what Jesus was saying by his initial silence and ignoring her. That's what the disciples were confirming by the way they uh, were treating her and talking about her. And then it seemed like that was even reconfirmed a third time by Jesus with his own word saying, I didn't come for the dogs. You know, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. But I think within that, again, what he was trying to do is get out what happened here. So this woman, rather than, than giving up, 
she, I think, had this, this obstinate, stubborn faith that refused to let go, refused to, to give up, refused to, um, to back down until she received the blessing that she knew Jesus could give. She was, I think, putting this confidence in his character. It seems like somehow she, she, she had this confidence of what Jesus could do. And I think inwardly, I think she, she knew that Jesus was the kind of, of man who could help her and that would help her. And so she just kept pressing and pressing and pushing and she would not back down no matter how much, how much evidence seemingly was telling her to stop. And so in the same way, I think for, again, not only for the unforgivable sin situation, but, but obviously that's the topic we're handling in this video. And so for those of you who feel like you're in that situation, I think this is a huge, a huge lesson for you in that situation. I think this is a huge, should be a huge encouragement and maybe give some clarity to you of, of maybe this is, is somewhat giving an indication um, of, of what's going on. Maybe you're, you're so wrapped up in this, this feelings, uh, these feelings of hopeless, uh, hopelessness and condemnation because God is, God is actually utilizing this situation. The situation that you think is all about you. It's all about how great your sin is, but God's ultimately going to work this to show you that this, this isn't about you and his grace and his ability and willingness to help you is far beyond what you, you can possibly think and imagine. I think we need to learn to give God's kindness and grace more credit than we give our sin. So be like this Canaanite woman, as you feel like you're hearing all these voices confirming to you that your situation is hopeless, refuse to let go, refuse to, 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 to let that be the end of the story. Like this woman did, she would not let that be the last word. She just kept pushing back. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She's responding to Jesus, Jesus's words. You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't come for the lost sheep of Israel, and and it's not right to give the bread to the dogs and not the children. And her response to that is is basically, okay, if you know, fine. I, if I'm a dog, even the dogs get the crumbs. And it's as if she's saying, you know, whatever, whatever it is that falls off the table of God's grace, that even just the crumbs are enough. I'm, I'm okay with the crumbs. If you, if you call me a dog, then I'm a dog, but the dogs get the crumbs. I just think within this, there's just this persistent faith, um, this, this faith that, that knows that this Jesus is the one to help me in my situation. He is the one with the power. He is the one with the ability he can do it and I cannot. And so I am fully dependent on him. And if all I get from him is the crumbs, she's saying that's enough. And it's as if at that moment, when that comes out of her, Jesus is saying, that's it. It's like, he's saying that that's, that's what I was, that's what I was doing. I don't, I don't think Jesus was being hateful again or, or mean or cruel, although it might appear that way. I think again, he was, he, he wanted in his wisdom to get this sort of response of, of childlike determined faith out of this woman. And after that, he healed her, uh, her daughter. So God responds to that faith. Abraham, it was the man of faith when he had this impossible situation, but God had promised to give him a son. He found himself as an old man. He found his wife barren without the ability to, to bear children this impossible situation. But the Bible talks about how Abraham counted God faithful. He counted him as good enough to, and powerful enough, able enough to fulfill his promise. And I think this, this principle of the Canaanite woman, I, I hope that's helpful to you. I, I think it should be. I think that should be some good direction on how you should respond to this situation. Respond with a persistent faith that refuses to let go, knows that God has the answers and the solution, and that if you keep pressing, if you wait for him, if you seek him, uh, no one who seeks him will be put to shame. Over and over, the scriptures talk about that. The one who takes refuge in him will not be condemned. Jesus says, the one who comes to me, I will not cast away. Um, the one who fears the Lord, seeks him, that's the person that God 
blesses and responds to. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Again, there's no stipulations put on that. It doesn't say ask and you will receive, seek and you will find. Unless you've committed sins X, Y, and Z, then that doesn't count for you. Um, I think so many people put so much stock into passages like the unforgivable sin passage in, in the Gospels, and they make that one passage override and overrule all the hundreds or thousands of scriptures that that um, that say something not different, not not contradicting it, but they say something that should give people hope. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. Don't uh, you know? Verse after verse reconfirming that truth, and then people. And what I what I think you should not do is let that one passage about the unforgivable sin overrule all those other ones. Three. Third thing I want to encourage you with, and I have just a, uh, several scriptures I'm going to read through really quickly and just pull a few things out of them, is just know <clears throat> the character of God. In all of this, I think even going back to the Canaanite woman, what this comes down to, I think, is, is believing the character of God. Again, like Abraham. Abraham believed that God was faithful. Abraham believed and knew God is not a liar. We need to believe and know that God is a God of mercy kindness and compassion, a God who delights in not the death of the wicked, but he delights in those who turn so that he can heal them, restore them. Know the character of God. Um, Ezekiel 18, 23 says, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? So the character of God is that he does not take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. We can get wrapped up in such wrong thinking about God. Those who are in this in this situation of fear of the unpardonable sin, I think we can start to think wrongly about who God is and his character and think that he's most interested in just watching out and trying to get anybody who steps out of line. God is a God who longs to show mercy and longs to redeem people. He He doesn't take pleasure um, even in... in um, punishment for for the wicked. That's not that's not something he gets like kicks out of. It's not like a, a favorite hobby of his or something like that. What God is seeking after, what he goes to great lengths to accomplish, which is proven by the death of his son on a cross, is that he wants to redeem people. That is what he is passionately pursuing and, and wants to do. John 4:16 says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is Love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So knowing the character of God, do not, do not forget in the midst of your condemnation. The, the Bible never says God is wrath or God is condemnation. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't real, that those aren't aspects, those aren't things that God expresses because he does and he will. But God is love, the very essence of who God is is love. If you think of all the, the kindness, you think of the nicest person in the world, you think of acts of mercy and goodness, compassion, all those things are just expressions of a, a truer reality. Those are just shadows, you, I think you could say, uh, of the true reality of love that is God. God is love. Mercy, kindness, compassion, these are all things that God just naturally expresses. It's just a part of who he is. That's how God is. That's how God feels. That's how God feels toward sinful people like you and like me. He feels compassion. There's passages where somebody would come to Jesus for healing and it would say Jesus felt uh, compassion. And, and, it, and it, the wording there actually conveys this idea of like this um, in his stomach, like this deep sense of compassion in his stomach. He just felt this strong compassion for people. And we can know that that's how, who God is and that's how he feels for us. And I think keep that aspect of God's character in mind as you're in this struggle. Psalm 137 through 8, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is loving devotion. With him is redemption in abundance. He will redeem Israel from all iniquity. That's for you too. 
he will redeem you from all iniquity. The only people whose iniquity will not uh, they will not be redeemed from it is those who don't come to Jesus for that redemption. The bigness of what Jesus has done on the cross and his resurrection, there's there's no height or depth of sin that Jesus didn't go go down to the very depths of, of, of our sin and take that on his uh, in his death on the cross and he went to the highest, heights of victory. He ascended higher than he could, uh, as high as victory needed to go to, to make it to where there is nothing in our way. There is no sin in our way. The only thing in our way from experiencing redemption is not coming to it, not receiving it. Um, with him is redemption in abundance, full redemption, complete redemption. Hebrews says Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. There's nothing that that his uh, abundant redemption cannot cover. Psalm 145, 8 through 9, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving devotion. The Lord is good to all and his compassion rests on all he has made. Meditate on these things. This is, this is God. This is who he is. This is what he's like. Isaiah 57, 15, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So this is saying God, God has two special dwelling places. Like God has two places he, he likes to hang out. The high and holy place and with those who are contrite and lowly in spirit, those who are lowly and contrite, those are the ones that God um, likes to be near to. And listen, I think Isaiah 66 2 kind of gives some clarity to, to part of what it means to be lowly and contrite, to fit into that category. Isaiah 66, 2 says, these are the ones I will look on with favor. So he's kind of saying the same thing. Like there's a, he has a special place in his heart for this certain kind of people, this certain category of people. He says, these are the ones that I, I live by. I live close to. These are the ones that, that I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Think about that especially in relation to this topic. So many of you who are maybe coming to this video or other videos looking looking for a solution to your terror and condemnation, this fear that you committed the unpardonable sin. What 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 are you doing? What is your what is your attitude become in this? This this is what it's become. It's become uh humble, contrite, and you are you are coming to the word of God and you're trembling at it. And that is a good thing, right? Like this, you're so convinced right now that you're condemned, your situation is hopeless, but yet you look at scriptures like these and these are telling you that no, actually what you're walking in right now, the humility that you're, you know, I'm seeing so many people on YouTube comments just desperate, opening up about just how how they failed, how they sinned, how they're desperate for God's mercy and help, um, and how they're terrified at the warnings he's giving. These are not people who are committing the unpardonable sin. These are not people who are who are locked out of, of the ability to truly repent or something like that. These are people who are being described, the same kind of people who are being described in Isaiah 57 and 62. These people coming in these YouTube comments, terrified by this idea of the unpardonable sin and convinced that they've committed it, they are in this category. This is you. You, you, you are humbled. Uh, a prideful person doesn't openly admit their failure and their sin and their need for God and their deserving of punishment. Uh, somebody who's not contrite in spirit doesn't desperately seek others for help and doesn't desperately seek God for mercy as you are doing. And those who are prideful and wicked and 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 obstinately against God in a place of it being impossible to repent, they don't tremble at God's word in a way that makes them desire to find his mercy. You guys are are humble. Well, a lot a lot of you, I, I don't know all of you, obviously, but I, I'm I'm just 
What I believe is that for the, the majority of people who really struggle with this fear of this sin, who come across these passages of scripture, they know this is God's word and it makes them tremble and fear. What that tells me is that you're not in the condition that you think you are and there is hope. The, these, these are the ones, God says, that I look on, I look on with favor. If you are humbled and contrite by your sin and failure, if you are trembling at his word, knowing what you deserve from a righteous and holy God, you're trembling at his word and you're desperately longing to have his mercy, you're desperately longing to live your life with God, then you are in, I would say, this category. You are one who God is looking on and will look on with favor. This is confirmed even more in the Gospels in Matthew 5, 3 through 4, when Jesus says, blessed, blessed are, who, who, who is it that's blessed? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. So the, the contrite in spirit, the, the humble, those who are aware. So I think, let me just put this down here. Poor in spirit equals contrite, those who are contrite. And I think you put this all together, those who are uh, trembling at the word of God, um, what all this comes down to is these people have an awareness of their sin. They have an awareness of it. And I think they, they agree, they are agreeing with God about their sin. They're agreeing with God that, about what they deserve. They're aware of their failure. They're aware of their need for mercy. They are poor in spirit. They are mourning over, over what they've done. Even, you know, I, I know what people are going to think when they, they hear some of these words. Like they're going to hear me saying they're mourning and they're going to, a lot of people are going to think, well, I see in my heart just this hardness of heart and, and, and I don't really feel bad about my sin or, or something like that. But I think, again, I would just encourage you guys not to get too caught up in the emotions, the spiritual emotions and feelings that you may or may not be feeling. Um, if you are wanting to seek God and you're willing to do what you need to do to, to follow him, if, if you want to believe in him and you want to turn from your sin, um, the let God be the one to bring those spiritual feelings to you, okay? If you wait for him, seek after him, uh, seek his face, he, he, he will produce in you the right spiritual emotions and feelings. But for those of you, again, those of you who are fearing the unpardonable sin, I, I'm convinced that you fit into this category of being poor in spirit, humble, contrite, you're trembling at the word of God. And that means what Jesus says about you is that you are in the category of people who are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are aware of who they are. Blessed are those who are conscious of their need for a savior, whose attention, who, who, who God has gotten their attention in a way that the, the fear of the Lord is, is causing them to be just painfully aware of their desperation, their desperate situation, and, and, and they are desperate for God. Jesus says, blessed are those people. Those who are sick spiritually, those are the ones Jesus came for. We're all sick spiritually. But the ones that Jesus wants to help are those who are aware of it and who are looking for a solution. Like you, you, see, that, you see that example in the people that Jesus healed. Over and over again, he heals these people who are just humbled and uh, in, in and of themselves hopeless to change their condition, but they're humbled by their their disease, their infirmity, whatever it is, which I think all those things have this spiritual uh, application to sin. You know, the blindness of the eyes, the deafness of the ears, 
the lameness of the feet, the, the, the leprosy. All these picture, I think, the sinful condition that we find ourselves in, the spiritual blindness and deafness and things like that. And it's those who are aware that that's who we are. That's what God is looking for. Those who are humble and contrite and who acknowledge who they are, they agree with God, which is what confession means. You confess, mean, meaning uh, repentance and confession is you, you're changing your mind about about your sin and about God, and you agree with him about what it is and about what should be done about it and, and what you need. And you confess that. You agree with God and what he says about it. People that are in that category are not without hope. You're not in an impossible situation. But actually, you are ones who God looks on with favor. You are you are the kind of person who God lives close to. Uh, God is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Uh, Psalm 34. And for so many of you, dealing with this fear of the unpardonable sin, that is you. And so in the, the next video, I want to go dive into Psalm 103 and Lamentations 3 and just share a few um, more encouragements from those. These are all scriptures that really, scriptures and concepts that really helped me in my time where, where I was um, one of those really wrestling with these passages, really uh, with the passages about the unpardonable sin, looking for answers, looking for hope. These, these ideas, these scriptures really helped me and they continue to help me. And, and so I hope that they uh, will help you as well.